On April 14, 1912, the Titanic struck a large iceberg, creating a huge gash on the right side of the ship. In less than three hours, the entire transatlantic is engulfed by the cold waters of the Atlantic Ocean, and out of the 2,200 passengers on board, only 705 survived. In this video, I suggest we go and see the accident dynamics, why the watertight compartments flooded, and the investigations on the wreck that later revealed many other details about the sinking. First, however, let's go see how the Titanic was built and why it was so important at the time. Ciao ragazzi! This video was written and filmed in Italian by our team of scientists, storytellers and video makers. We are Italians. It was manually translated into English, but dubbed with artificial intelligence. Long live culture and let's go back to the video! When the Titanic was built, it was the largest ship ever, about 269 meters long, with 25 floors and a gross tonnage of about 46,000. It was practically a floating luxury hotel, such an avant-garde work of engineering that it was defined as unsinkable. The Titanic's construction began on March 31st, 1909 in Dublin. It begins with the keel, which is the structure at the bottom of the ship that makes it stable. Let's say it's like its backbone. Around this structure, first the bottom of the ship was built in steel and then the hull. The hull is like the skin of the ship and it was composed of steel panels riveted together and as we will see. This detail will be of extreme importance to understand what caused such a rapid sinking of the transatlantic liner. At the bottom of the hull, there were a total of 16 watertight compartments. At the time, they were a symbol of innovation, so much so that it was believed that thanks to them, the ship would be unsinkable. As for the engine compartment, the Titanic had what were known as reciprocating engines, which were powered by coal and allowed the two side propellers of the transatlantic ship to be set in motion. There was additionally a turbine engine that instead provided power to the central propeller utilized for open sea navigation. But how much did a ship like this consume? Just imagine, to make a transatlantic crossing, about 650 tons of coal per day were needed for a total of about 4,000 tons for the entire journey. In fact, the journey was supposed to last about six days. To load the coal onto the ship, special hatches were used. A fun fact, at that time the hulls of ships were painted black. Do you know the reason why? Just to conceal the coal stains that were created around these hatches. The smoke from the coal boilers was transported outside through these structures known as funnels. They don't look like funnels, because they are upside down funnels. The Titanic had four funnels the last of which was fake and was included for purely aesthetic reasons. Last detail, the lifeboats. On board, there were 20 lifeboats with a maximum capacity of 1,178 people. This means that even in the best case scenario, about half the crew would not have been able to save themselves in the event of an accident. The concept of a tragedy, however, was far from people's minds and once the construction was finished, the Titanic was prepared to embark on its inaugural voyage. Additionally, apart from being an engineering marvel for that period, the Titanic was also the ultimate in terms of comfort and extravagance. The interiors were meticulous in every detail and for that time it was without a doubt a truly unique experience of its kind. The idea was to make passengers feel like they were inside a luxury hotel rather than on a ship. Not by chance, some furnishings were inspired by those of the Versailles court. And inside the ship, there were bars, smoking areas, pools, pianos, and large halls for parties. In short, it had it all. And remember that it was the early 1900s. Nowadays, they might seem like unexceptional things, ones that all ships have. But back then, at the start of the 20th century, it wasn't the case. The Titanic's first and only journey was its maiden voyage on April 10th, 1912, led by Captain Edward John Smith, and which was planned to have a duration of six days. Thanks also to the film with the great Leonardo DiCaprio, it's often thought that the Titanic set sail from Southampton in England and headed straight to New York. 
Actually, before crossing, two stops were made to collect passengers, one in Cherbourg, France, and one in Queenstown, Ireland. Altogether, there were a total of 2,200 people on board the ship during the crossing. On the route of the Titanic, there is an area that also at that time was renowned for its icebergs. Certain studies indicate that wind and ocean currents actually caused the icebergs to move further south than they normally would during that specific time of year, but not beyond the maximum limits observed throughout the 20th century. In other words, it wasn't so unlikely that huge mountains of ice might be encountered along the way. In fact, other ships had previously sent radio messages to the Titanic regarding the presence of icebergs in the region. The ship Masaba at 9.45 p.m. or the ship California at 10.55 p.m. which announced being stuck in the ice in the same area. But why were these messages ignored? The radio station on board the ship was not only used to receive messages from other ships, but also to transmit messages internally within the ship. In the majority of instances, these were messages sent from one passenger to another. They were most likely so full of messages that they essentially disregarded those coming from other ships, without ever getting that information to the command bridge. Meanwhile, the Titanic is dangerously approaching an iceberg at a speed of 22 knots, which is about 40 kilometers per hour. At 11.35 p.m., a massive iceberg is sighted off the coast of Newfoundland Island in Canada. When sighted, the iceberg is very close. Less than 400 meters from the ship, the engines are immediately activated in reverse mode and the rudder turned all the way to the left to try to avoid the ice obstacle. But at 11.40 p.m., unfortunately, the front right part of the hull hits the iceberg, creating a series of piers about 90 meters long. These red lines you see are the hull lesions where increasingly more water is beginning to enter. The bow begins to sink and at around midnight the other watertight compartments also start to flood. But why? How can watertight compartments flood? As you can see, the compartments were only divided by vertical barriers, meaning that water could pass from above. And in fact, the more the ship tilted, the more the water managed to overflow into the compartment. Each flooded compartment caused the ship to tilt further. As a result, other compartments were flooded as well. As we can see in these images, one by one, all the compartments from bow to stern were flooded. Essentially, they were not designed well. At 2 a.m., the ship is tilted to such an extent that the engine propellers are out of the water. At 2.10 a.m., the bow of the ship is completely underwater and the stern is tilted about 45 degrees. Now, the weight of the three propellers, about 100 tons, creates a lever effect, breaking the upper part of the transatlantic in half. At 2.18 a.m., both parts will sink within the next half hour. In case you were curious, ships nowadays are obviously not designed in this way anymore. In fact, just a couple of years after the Titanic disaster, a document was drafted, the International Convention for the Safety of Life at Sea, abbreviated in English to SOLAS, which, to put it simply, explains how ships must be designed to ensure the safety of passengers. It is a document that is continuously being updated and is still in force. Today, however, the two ends of the Titanic are located on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, at a depth of about 3,800 meters, about 600 meters apart. The wreck stayed untouched there, surprisingly, for 73 years until September 1st, 1985. I was 10 days old when oceanographer Bob Ballard discovered the remains of the transatlantic liner. So, does the story end here? Well, not exactly. A question that no one could answer with certainty was why the Titanic sank so quickly. According to the designers, this avant-garde ship should have taken a few days to sink, not a few hours. Now to the investigations carried out on the wreck. Here the discovery of the wreckage allowed us to answer this question. During the investigation, a piece of steel from the hull was collected. It was then subjected to various tests and analyses. These tests revealed that the hull of the Titanic was made of a steel that was extremely rich in sulfur. 
Here we have it. Sulfur in steel is really not a good thing because it decreases flexibility. So, when subjected to stress, it cracks. It is stiffer. This is because sulfur reacts with steel and with the iron it contains forming crystals of ferrous sulfide. This under stress can give rise to micro cracks which then lead the steel to rupture. Today, fortunately, sulfur levels in steel are generally low, but at that time production techniques were less refined and therefore this element was much more abundant. So, to the moral of the story, the presence of the sulfur combined with the high speed of the impact and the low temperature of the Canadian waters caused the Titanic's hull and rivets to be severed irreparably as soon as the transatlantic liner hit the iceberg. In any case, the Titanic remains a great tragedy that is still remembered today as one of the worst maritime disasters of all time. I hope our story was an interesting one and that it has provided you with some details that you didn't already know. See you again soon here on Geopop, science in everyday life. Ciao!